Welcome everyone, my name is Brenda Venegas and I am recruitment counselor here at the University of St. Thomas' UST Max Center. Today we will be listening to the lunch, lunch and Learn on exploring servant leadership and the characteristics that resonate with, with us. So with us today, our speaker, uh, she, as Chief University Services Officer, Dr. Alcindor leads University of St. Thomas Houston's facilities, IT Human Services, UST Police Department, Campus Services, and this center, UST Max. She transitioned into this leadership role after five years at the university, where she has served as Senior Director of Alumni Relations and Senior Director of UST Max Center. In addition to her administrative roles, Dr. Alcindor is an instructor in the university's freshman symposium program and teaches ESL to adult learners here at UST Max. Prior to her career at UST, she served at Frasati Catholic High School in spring for seven years and Centenary College of Louisiana for eight years. Dr. Alcindor holds an, a PhD in leadership studies from Our Lady of the Lake University, an MBA from Centenary College, and a BFA in radio, television, and film from Sam Houston State University. She serves on several nonprofit boards and committees, including Incarnate Word Academy in Houston and the City of Conroe's Historic Downtown Main Street Advisory Board. She is an active member of St. Simon and Jude Parish in the Woodlands, where she serves on the Pastoral Council, chairs the Stewards Stewardship Council, and is a lector and assist the pastor with leadership development. So please help me in welcoming Dr. Carla Alcindor. Okay, thank you Brenda for that wonderful introduction. Again, my name is Carla and we're here today to talk about servant leadership. And I really appreciate the fact that all of you decided to come and join us for this quarter's Lunch and Learn. Uh, we've been doing these Lunch and Learns for the last three years since we've opened the center on a quarterly basis. And so this month, um, I have the pleasure of being your, your presenter. And yes, we're here to talk a little bit about servant leadership. How many of you consider yourselves to be leaders? And how many of you consider yourselves to be followers? <laughs> Great, and I imagine that if you're not already considering yourself to be a servant leader, that that's something that you're very interested in learning a little bit more about today, and I hope I can help unpack that for you. So what do we mean when we talk about servant leadership? Essentially, a servant leader is a leader who chooses to serve first. A servant leader is not just someone that serves or leads people who serve others, but rather he or she is in fact a servant first. Okay. This phrase was coined by Robert K. Greenleaf back in the 1970s. He's widely considered to be the father of modern servant leadership because he did coin that phrase and he did a lot of work toward figuring out what servant leadership means, first of all to him and how he's able to ex express that and help others to express that within their day-to-day -day workings within organizations, corporations, businesses. And so Robert Greenleaf said this, the servant leader is servant first. It begins with the natural feeling that one wants to serve, to serve first then conscious choice brings one to aspire to lead. He worked for AT&T um, for the duration of his career, and it was during his time there that he started recognizing that the line workers and the folks out there really doing the hard work were not just serving the company, but they were actually able to lead others in the process of, of improvement and, and making, doing what was really best and right for the company. And so he did a lot of thinking about what that truly meant. And that's, this is what he came to, servant leadership. He says that the servant leader shares power, puts the needs of others first, and helps people develop and perform as highly as possible. This pretty much encapsulates it. Good leaders must first become good servants. Amen? Amen. <laughs> All right. 
I thought this was interesting too. I pulled this one on here for you from Kim Blanchard, the author of The One Minute Manager. And this is what he had to say about servant leadership. It's all about making the goals clear and then rolling your sleeves up and doing the hard work. Uh, whatever it takes to help the people win. In that situation, they don't work for you, you work for them. It's pretty great. And then this gentleman here, I'm sure you are all familiar with, M. Scott Peck, he wrote The Road Less Traveled. He says servant leadership is more than a concept, it's a fact. Any great leader, by which I also mean an ethical leader, so he's bringing in the ethics aspect of servant leadership, will see himself or herself as a servant of that group and will act accordingly. So it's, it, essentially, I think what he's saying is that leadership from a servant leadership perspective is an ethical choice. I find that to be quite interesting. So uh, by way of example, I pulled some uh, famous servant leaders together for us to, to look at just to help frame our conversation today. And I'm going to go through them quickly. I'm sure you know of many others who would be considered servant leaderships throughout history. But these are a few that I think really rise to the top. Abraham Lincoln. For the servant leader, leadership is not about the power or the position, but rather the desire to lead others. And so this was sort of his concept. He had the desire to lead, not just because it was going to be, make him a more powerful person, but he truly wanted to lead others. And from that perspective, he was a servant. I love this one, Susan B. Anthony, because this lady did not set out to be a leader. She set out to serve the needs of the underserved, her fellow women. The quote says it all. No man is good enough to govern any woman without her consent. And so she saw a problem and set about to resolve that problem by leading an effort to, uh, to bring the right to vote to women in our country. She didn't set out to be a leader, but in fact, she ended up being a great leader. I mean, she led the entire suffrage movement simply because she saw an injustice that she wanted fixed. And so as a result, we would consider Susan B. Anthony to be an amazing example of servant leadership. I mean, she was so successful at her, in her efforts to lead. She, she's on a coin, right? So she's certainly gone down in history as a result of her desire to serve others and to lead in the process. And then Martin Luther King, Jr., an amazing example of servant leader. One of the things that he had to say is to recognize that he who is greatest among you shall be your servant. And let's listen a little bit to Martin Luther King and what he has to say about serving. If you want to be a part of wonderful, if you want to be recognized wonderful, if you want to be great wonderful, Recognize that he was the greatest among you. That's the definition of greatness. This morning, the thing that I like about it, that given that definition of greatness, it means that everybody can be great. Because everybody can do that. You don't have to have a college degree to serve. You don't know, you don't have to. Make your subject and your goal free to serve. You don't have to know about Plato and Aristotle to serve. You don't have to know Einstein's spirit of relativity to serve. You don't have to know the second theory of thermodynamics in physics to serve. When I shared that clip with my students down at the main campus, it's like, yeah, this is all very true about servant leadership, but we still want your subject and your verb to agree. So, <laughs> so don't take that too literally, right? <laughs> all right, let's move on. 
Here's another great example of a servant leader, Nelson Mandela. And I really like his perspective, and I wanted to share this with you all today. A leader is like a shepherd. He stays behind the flock, letting the most nimble go out ahead, whereupon the others follow, not realizing that all along they've been led from behind. And so this is one of the, the important characteristics, in my opinion, about servant leadership. A servant leader is able to step back. Right, step back and let others go out in front. And Mel Nelson Mandela exemplified that beautifully in his life. And then finally, Mother Teresa. This is another example of someone that did not set out to become a leader. She set out to serve the, the poorest of the poor, the neediest of the needy. And her philosophy was such as, if you can't feed 100 people, then feed just one. I mean, she set about to, to help people one person at a time. And through those efforts, clearly she became an amazing leader. I mean, let's just take a look at some of the things about Mother Teresa through her life. She founded the Missionaries of Charity, which are still you know, very vibrant today. She was a tireless advocate for the poor. And um, through, her, through the process of doing the work that she did in India, she became a world-renowned speaker. Everyone around the entire world knows of Mother Teresa. She was an advisor to the Pope. I mean, not, not just everyone can walk hand in hand with the Pope, right? Mother Teresa was at the very highest level of the Catholic Church. And then, once again, was considered a mother. She became known as Mother Teresa. She was a mother to so many in need. This is what she set out to do. But in her efforts to serve those who needed it, she became all of these things and then ultimately a saint. So she's a very um, poignant, I think, example of servant leadership in, during our time. Mother Teresa, Saint Teresa of Calcutta. Okay, so those are uh, some of the examples of modern day servant leaders, if you will. But this can go back clearly to Jesus Christ himself, and even before that. Servant leadership is not something new just since Robert K. Greenleaf coined the phrase. What he did is he brought servant leadership into the business world, into the corporate environment, and uh, organizationally figured out how you can go about becoming a servant leader. And that's what I'm going to help you all unpack today. How can we um, utilize servant leadership within our organizations and within our companies? I wanted to set the groundwork by giving you some of those great examples, but we cannot go forward without looking at Jesus Christ himself, Jesus' teacher and master. He said, <laughs> he who is greatest among you shall be your servant. Whoever exalts himself will be humbled, and whoever humbles himself will be exalted. Jesus said, here I am among you as one who serves. So with that, let's think about how we can become servant leaders or better servant leaders. There are ways that we can go about doing that that will flip this concept on its head. His idea of servant leadership is we serve, he leads. Right? This isn't what we want in our organizations. We want to be more of the leader who serves, which in essence flips the organizational structure, once again, on its head. Here you have the more traditional form of leadership, where you have your leader at the top and all the team leaders up serving that leader. Here we have more of a servant leadership approach with the team leader serving the members of the team. So here the leader is on the bottom serving the leaders or the, the team members. And this is what we want to try to get to in ser with servant leadership within our companies. Servant leadership by no means is the only form of leadership. It's one form of leadership. And it doesn't necessarily have to be the only form of leadership that you employ within your organizations. Um, leadership takes on different looks and different feels depending on circumstances that you find yourself in at the time. But in my opinion, servant leadership can always serve as sort of an undergirding, if you will, of whatever style of leadership you need to use within your organization, depending on what's going on um, from day to day. And so what we want to do is to be a little bit more like this guy. Okay, look at his door. He has about every designation and almost every alphabet behind his name that you could possibly have. 
And yet, it's all wrapped up by the statement, your humble servant. So, there to serve. This is what we want to get to. So how do we get to that? Well, there's been a great deal of study about servant leadership. It is, it is not just a concept, an idea, or something that you need to figure out on your own. It's been empirically studied quite a bit, actually, over the years. It hasn't been studied as much as some of the more traditional forms of leadership, but it has definitely been studied to an extent that provides us with some tools that we can use. And these are the tools that I want to share with you today. So I have chosen four models of servant leadership that have been studied. They've been studied by these researchers, Spears, Lobb, Barbudo, and Wheeler, and Van Durendonk and Newton. And so I'm going to break this down for you very quickly, and then we're going to have a little interactive activity that's going to, I hope, help you unpack for yourselves which characteristics of servant leadership most resonate with you. And that's what it comes down to, by the way. It's just characteristics, different ways that we can uh, present ourselves and exude our intentions within our organizations um, to, to serve first. Okay, so let's start with Spears. Larry Spears worked for Robert K. Greenleaf, and so I'm starting with his model of servant leadership because his model is based specifically on the writings of, of Greenleaf. And in his studies, he narrowed it down to these 10 characteristics. These are the things that he feels is, are important to, um, to have as, in your toolkit, if you will, as a servant leadership, as a servant leader. And you can see them there on the screen, empathy, healing, awareness, persuasion, etc. We're gonna get more specifically into these in a minute, so you don't need to, to remember them. I actually have a takeaway for you. And then this researcher developed what he called the servant organizational leadership assessment. And there are six characteristics that he narrowed his uh, model down to and studied. Valuing people, developing people, building community, displaying authenticity, providing leadership, and sharing leadership. And then these guys did their study called the Servant Leadership Questionnaire. Um, and these tools are available, by the way, if you ever wanted to um, assess servant leadership in your organizations. So they narrowed it down to these five. And then this one, finally, the Servant Leadership Survey, I think is a very good one as well. And it includes ac accountability, authenticity, courage, empowerment, forgiveness, humility, standing back, and stewardship. Okay, so let's unpack all of that. Like I said, I have a takeaway for you, and I wanna give you guys some time to kind of think through in your own minds what servant leadership means to you and how that might be applied. Thanks, Brenda. How that might be applied in your organizations. So with the handout, the little packet booklet, I'd like to encourage you to go through the different models, the four models of servant leadership, and just circle those characteristics that most resonate to you. What are those things that really jump out for you, whether you're already practicing these behaviors or if it's something that you hadn't thought about in this way before and think, oh yes, I think that really would um, benefit me and those in my organization or even in my family or in my church community uh, if I were able to utilize these characteristics a little bit more or maybe in a different way than I have in the past. And let's just take a few minutes. I'll give you guys plenty of time. I'm going to sit down and do it as well. Okay. How are we done? <coughs> Good. <coughs> so before we start unpacking this uh, specifically and sharing our thoughts with each other, I'd like to learn a little bit more about each of you and what it is that you do, what type of organization you're thinking about servant leadership being uh, connected to, and what your role as a leader might be. We can start anywhere, if anybody has a burning desire to, to jump in. When I look around the room, 
I feel like probably everyone that is in here is still actively employed. Am I correct? Mm -hmm. Sure. Uh, yes. No. Well, guess what, folks? I'm not actually. We're not. We're not. Okay. Well, not I've, been, I've been retired for 13 years. So what I do as a servant leader is at First Methodist Church Conroe here. We have a group that um, we actively support. It's called the Gathering Place. I don't know if any of y'all are familiar with it, but it's part of Care Partners Texas which is in Houston. It's a nonprofit organization. And what we are doing is giving people that have dementia, Alzheimer's, early stage, and to moderately, uh, moderate forms of dementia. <clears throat> and they come once a month. We call it our gathering. And uh, that, this is where we show love, unconditional love. Uh, we have planned games. We have a theme every month. I have 22 volunteers. Uh, we have right now, we also are at our max. We have 22 families. And when I say families, the care partner is the person who actually has the dementia. And then the caregiver is usually the spouse, sometimes, you know, a child. Once in a great while, it'll be a paid, you know, caregiver that comes with them. Mm -hmm. But my part of leadership, I <clears throat> I call the event leader. Then I have another lady. I don't have her. Another volunteer is Linda Newsom, and uh, she handles one side of it, and I handle the other side. But uh, everything is volunteer led. Uh, we, the two of us have only been in this position since January of this year. However, the gathering place at First Methodist has been there for 25 years. So what we have done, uh, and are always in the process of doing, is looking to find ways to encourage the volunteers to use their gifts for them to be more a major part of what we're doing in each day's event mm -hmm. instead of just like me I stand up there and I direct the day but it's not about me it's about everyone else that is there yeah. so it's it is a way of encouraging the volunteers finding out what their gifts are and some of them may have never been in the position yeah they like to do this or that but they never really put themselves out there to do it okay so well that's Let's think of, okay, and that, that is a significant challenge often seen in church environments. So let's think about some of these characteristics when we started on, uh, sharing with each other a little bit about our unpacking process that might be of help to you in that, in that scenario. Yes. Oh, yes. Um, I love working on several projects. I'm retired from one career, and I'm segueing into another career, kind of just trying to figure out my way. Mm -hmm. I do. Mm -hmm. There's several options, so I don't really know for sure right now I'm helping teach uh, some students and I also mentor students. But um, I, I, I don't know that I'll be going into teaching that's really, but I'm just trying to figure out what I'm going to be doing. Okay. But one thing I wanted to say, and I think it's super important, is that throughout my career um, and in different periods of my life, I haven't always been a title leader, but I still was a leader. Does mm -hmm. that make sense? Of course. And I, I always try to um, encourage people at every level of their organization to be a leader where they are. Because everybody has an opportunity, they just don't always see it. Mm -hmm. That's right. You have to bring it out in people. Right. Yes. So. And that's something that we should think about and remember within all of our organizations. When I started out by saying who among us considers ourselves a leader and then a follower, at some points in time we're, we're one or the other. Um, but we're at, at some point most definitely in a leadership capacity. Position power is the only kind of power that there is, right? So, right. yeah. Okay. You want to go next? Sure. <laughs> <laughs> um, my name is uh, Bobby Matthias. I work for a nonprofit organization in Montgomery and Liberty County called Motivation Education and Training Incorporated. Um, we, are, uh, we are one of the grants that I and my project manager for one of the grants that they uh, they run within the two counties called uh, Met Fatherhood, 
Uh, mm. So we make motivation to be trained short, so met for sure. Mm. So we're called Met Fatherhood. We basically we do uh, fatherhood workshops uh, through a curriculum that's provided through the National Fatherhood Initiative um, that we present to any father or father figure in the community that has a child of between ages 0 and 17. <coughs> Currently I do have a workshop going. Uh, I just came from it every Monday morning at 9.30 at the Workforce in Conroe. I have about 10 fathers that show up every Monday uh, for about 12 weeks. Um, once they complete, we give them a certificate for completing. The, the, the reason why this appealed to me whenever I first um, when I first heard about it, the guy I think I had one before was on AI, and I was like, oh, mm -hmm. that really doesn't anything else. I was like, but then when I heard of servant leadership, it, it was funny because I had never really heard of servant leadership before until I became a project manager. And then recently I, I took on the role as a uh, junior, I mean, uh, assistant youth pastor at my church. So between that and when we talk about the qualities of a father or a father figure within your within your family and dynamic and leadership always comes up with but I don't think a lot of fathers realize that they are certain leaders in, in, in a way and I, I was looking at yeah. I think with option uh, <clears throat> number three on the assessment mm -hmm. you know a lot of characteristics are not with the fathers that, that we, uh, we work with you know they help support and serve their children to grow and succeed, mm -hmm. you know, and we talk about that in our, in our curriculum about how discipline, the way we grew up was looked at one way, but it's to teach it to guide. And we talk about positive role models that were teachers and teachers had disciples. So who are your disciples? We reference that to your children and how where are those positive teachers and Jesus, Jesus Christ himself always comes up and it's like, you know, it just brings it into perspective and I just, I thought it really, I'm really glad that it came. Awesome, I'm glad you came as well. Thank you. Mayor Jody? I'm Jody Chikoski, I'm in the real estate investment business and local city government. And uh, I left my friend here, I'm, I'm trying to find my way. <laughs> um, what, what was your question? Um, just to give us an idea of what organizationally you're looking at servant <laughs> leadership. Uh, in regards to, uh, yeah, and uh, I, I, I should have introduced you earlier and acknowledged your presence here with us today, Mayor Jody. I, I, when I was younger, I liked to serve from the back, and lately I've had to serve from the front. <laughs> I'm looking forward to getting back. To the back. <laughs> 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 so the wings are in the back, isn't it? <laughs> yeah, I don't know. My business, you, you have people that, that they like to serve out front, and sometimes they're servers, sometimes they're not. Yeah, exactly. Well, you know. More talk in the service. Nelson Mandela had more to say about that than what I put on the screen today. It's true what he said about, you know, being in the back um, as, as his philosophy. But then when times are tough and the servant needs to, the, excuse me, the leader needs to step forward, he will or she will in fact do that and come forward and deal with the hard stuff uh, on behalf of the followers. But when things are going good, step to the back and give them the glory, if you will. So you can, yeah, you can have a little combination of those things going on. Good to see you. Thank you. Thanks for being here. Uh, for me, uh, I teach at our church here, not, not at the school at Sacred Heart, but to the, to the um, congregation there. I, I teach theology and do evangelization also there. And then I'm also uh, the scoutmaster for our troop there, which is quite more challenging than any of the other things that I've done. And I've, been, and I've been doing that for six years now. And, uh, it, uh, and I've been in scouts for 25 years, so there's a lot of, of uh, leadership and, and following and um, being able to work with parents, probably usually more than kids, is, is the biggest issues I usually have. Kids you can deal with, uh, Interesting. but sometimes it's the adults that are probably a bit harder to, to work with sometimes. And so, for me, I think that's learning some of this and how to be able to work with people not only in church but also in organizations like Scouting. Mm -hmm. That's great. Yeah, I'm hoping that some of these characteristics are jumping out at you today. That's good. Hi. Yeah, I did not get a name badge, but uh, Oscar Martinez, I'm happy to be here. Uh, I identified with a couple different things you had said. Um, you talked about who's a leader. Uh, with my background, I have a background in public service to uh, being a professor at Lone Star uh, College System. Uh, with that leading into being my newest onset of uh, 
commercial real estate, which I'm green and I'm very much a follower now yet. So within three days time, I go from leader, follower, leader, follower, then mm -hmm. back and forth. So mm -hmm. uh, to learn different techniques or uh, aspects or to, to move forward with all that, I think is, is great. Awesome. So, I'm so glad you came. Thank you. Thank you. Um, Scott. Scott Elias. Um, I'm a finance professional and entrepreneur. Um, I've worked at across secular and I guess religious organizations. So I've uh, done everything from being a youth minister at a Catholic church. Um, I was a financial analyst at KCJ, the uh, radio station. Um, and those places you really find, so kind of the opposite of what you were saying, of um, how do I implement these secular ideas into a church setting, um, which I found at in those church settings was much more simple because I could overtly use the name of Jesus or, right, discipleship, those kind of things. Um, but implementing those same concepts into a secular setting can prove to be difficult. But what I have found to work is to be yourself and still live as that person. Just don't overtly speak Jesus' name, I guess. So, so, I, mean, I guess is the, the way around it in a uh, secular setting or a corporate setting. But um, yeah, that, that is, I think, kind of the interesting thing. and. Uh, the one thing that really struck me was um, I've never said, you know, that's not my job or this is beneath me or I'm not going to do that. Um, but seeing Jesus washing the feet, and I thought about that and how um, he washed the feet of all the disciples, including the ones that he knew were going to betray him and did it anyway. And like, so like, how could I ever say, like, this is like, I'm, I'm not going to do that or what's, mm, what's beneath, beneath me, me at that point? Yeah. So, Anyway, that was just one thing that caught my eye. So, Thank you for yeah, sharing. Absolutely. That's awesome. Hi. Uh, hi, I'm Tim, uh, Tim Nessler. And um, I, uh, when I come into an organization, the first thing that I always remind everybody of is humility. Mm. I really push humility in, in, in that organization. So uh, I'm finally going to retire from being a CEO of a company, which I'm looking forward to here at the end of this year. Uh, so I'm going to really want to learn, uh, you know, some things from this or, uh, session to help me. I'm, I'm on the board of trustees for the University of Finley, so I know your university very well. Okay. And I'm also chairman of the finance and, and the business affairs committee for the University of Finley. So trying to get, you know, 40 trustees to agree when you're making a presentation is always, you always need to go back to a lot of these attributes and try to, sway the vote, you know, somehow, some way through humility and understanding with empathy of what their issues are and that kind of stuff. So also I sit on the, uh, uh, the Depulchin Children's Home Foundation, mm -hmm. and there I don't have to worry about uh, a, a leadership role. I can be a follower. I just done a lot of the uh, members on that. And then uh, I also sit on Today's Harbor for Children wow. as a, a board of trustees and also treasurer of that organization. So. Uh, again, trying to move from the corporate world into more of the charitable world mm -hmm. and spend more time there, uh, trying to see how this all fits together. So that's why uh, I thought it would be a good opportunity to come today. Well, thank you for coming. It's very nice to have you with us. And all of you, what you shared, I think, is really powerful for the op opportunity to incorporate some servant leadership concepts mm -hmm. into what you do on a day-to-day -day basis, whether it's still within the corporate environment or your volunteer work or in your church work as well. And so with that, thank you for sharing your introductions with us. I'd like to ask you then, whoever would like to just um, speak out, within these four models, what are some of the characteristics that you circled? I picked up on several as I was listening to you here, but I would just like for you guys to tell each other what things resonated most with you? If you didn't already say it. Yes, Chris. I say empathy. Um, I have a history of working for the government. Mm -hmm. and it's very sort of uh, the way, it, it's a command and control structure. Uh, that's how it began. It's kind of modeled after the military. Mm -hmm. But as we move into the 20th century and beyond, I think we're looking more into EQ and and just being, having more empathy towards people rather than just ensuring the tasks are done. 
and I think that's really important and being able to see. Listening is a form of empathy, in my opinion, because you're hearing what somebody else is saying, and you're reciprocating. Mm -hmm. Active listening, you're reciprocating. But uh, that's something I, and I hear it from, from people. That's really important to them right now. They need to feel, uh, rather than just going to work, they need to feel they're valued. That's very important. That's great. I think you said something really important there when you said, in your opinion, listening is a form of, of empathy. And so if we are able to put ourselves in the other person's shoes for a moment and empathize with what they're saying or uh, the experience that they're, they're sharing with us, then we're, we're, we will be able to better serve their needs because we can truly relate right, with what they're experiencing or did experience. Yeah. So empathy, that's a good one. What else? So I think getting back to humility again, you know, one of the areas that I've always found to be beneficial if you're going to grow leadership is, is not only the humility side of things, you know, letting them know that their humility is very, very important to personal development, but also the idea of forgiveness. Mm -hmm. You know, people are going to make mistakes. And, you know, you have to sometimes, in my mind, you always have to let them make that mistake so that they learn from that mistake and then they can grow from that mistake, right? And that's how you're going to empower people to become leaders as well, because you're learning through the mistake and empowering them to do that stuff. So, and, uh, and we as leaders will mis make mistakes as well, sure. and it's important for us to be able to forgive ourselves along the way. That's a really important aspect of servant leadership, yeah. to recognize that that's the case and to be able to forgive oneself going forward. Yeah. What else? That was the same for me, actually. Um, I, and I circled two in particular was humility and accountability. So, um, and what I wrote down was humility in the face of accountability. So, exactly what you were just talking about. So, yeah. Very good. Others? I guess in the, the scouting program, uh, being the scoutmaster, I have a system to help. A lot of times it's easier sometimes to do it yourself. And, the previous scoutmaster was like that. He he did everything, and it was hard shoes to step into. But um, I think it's been a growth on my part to not try to match what he was doing before, and actually utilize the whole committee, utilize your assistants, scoutmasters, and whatnot, so that the, actually the program works better if you've got involvement from other people and they have a some skin in the game, right? They're they're involved in it, and so it they want to make the program better. And then, of course, their kids in there. So, because their child's in there, they should have some skin in the game, yeah. not be sitting on the sidelines and always tell people when they first come. We usually have a parent meeting, and, and I said, BSA does not stand for Babysitters of America. So, you <laughs> need your help in, in leading, not only just dropping your kid off. And um, and I think part of the other aspect of teaching classes and also from evangelization is that um, I found in the in, the last few years that there's a lot of baggage that people bring with them no matter where you are i don't care if it's scouting or class or wherever it is um and healing i think has, has been something that's been mm. on my forefront uh, in recent time because it's difficult for people to either buy into the the, the faith stuff or even into uh the scouting <coughs> which is very oriented, oriented towards the characteristics of of um, a great people, I mean, and the virtues of, of, of faith. And so all those things come together, and you have people from all walks of life coming in, not only in the scout program, but even in, in class settings. And they're, they're, in a sense, the first part is they need to find some way to be able to, to feel like they belong. And a lot of them come with a lot of baggage, like I said, uh, broken families and scouts, or whatever it may be. And you want to build the second part where I see here is building community mm. where they feel like they belong to a family, right? Mm -hmm. And that's one of the things that like in scouting, for example, that I've seen throughout my many, many years is that when you see some of these boys come in, especially with maybe just a mom or a dad, um, that they feel that they have a community they come into. And so it's more than just an organization. It becomes a, a family in a certain sense. Yeah. Very good. Yeah. Okay, any other last thoughts on characteristics? All right, so I wanted to make the point that, as I said before, these are four very distinct, uh, empirically tested models of servant leadership. 
right? There are many others out there, but these are the four that I selected to include. What we did was an exercise of asking ourselves which characteristics out of any one of the four most resonate with us. And so what you've done essentially is designed your own model of servant leadership. And so I would encourage you, even though it's not going to have been empirically tested, anecdotally, right? Anecdotally, you can use this information as your own design of servant leadership. So whichever characteristics you circled, you could actually make your own list right here on the back. And I'll encourage you to do that. But before you make your own list of characteristics that define servant leadership for you, I'd like you to take the top part of this and write a one sentence definition of servant leadership. What is your definition of servant leadership. Okay, if you haven't fully fleshed that out, that's okay. You can take this and continue thinking about it and uh, coming up with what you want your servant leadership definition to be. And then, like I said, add your characteristics underneath there and then you will have um, a tool that you can take back and employ in your organizations. I love this anonymous quote. I wish I knew who said it, because I think it's right to the point. I mean, if serving is below you, then leadership is beyond you. That that's, encapsulates the whole concept of what servant leadership is all about. And remember what Dr. Martin Luther King had to say, you only need a heart full of grace. So anyone can develop servant leadership traits within your families, within your volunteer organizations, within your church communities, within your businesses and organizations, boards, corporations, if you have a heart full of grace. Because what that does is it sets us up to think of the other's needs first. We serve first. And that's my presentation for you today on Servant Leadership. Thank you so much.